Section 23 of Anecdotes of Dogs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M. J. Frank. Anecdotes of Dogs by Edward Jesse. Chapter 23. The Pointer. The subtle dog scours with sagacious nose along the field, and snuffs each breeze that blows. Against the wind he takes his prudent way, while the strong gale directs him to the prey. Now the warm scent assures the covey near, he treads with caution and he points with fear. The fluttering coveys from the stubble rise, and on swift wing divide the sounding skies. The scattering lead pursues the certain sight, and death in thunder overtakes their flight. Gay This dog has been crossed and recrossed so often with the foxhound, the setter, and the old Spanish pointer, that the originality of the present breed may be questioned, especially as the pointer has been less noticed by writers on dogs than any other of the species. How well do I recollect in my early youth seeing the slow, heavy, solemn-looking, and thick-shouldered Spanish pointer, tired with two or three hours' work in turnips, and so stiff after it the next day, as to be little capable of resuming his labors. And yet this dog, fifty years ago, was to be met with all through England. How different is the breed at the present time! By crossing with the foxhound, they have acquired wonderful speed, and a power of endurance equally surprising, while their shape is beautiful, and their sense and animation strongly marked in their intelligent countenances. The old pointers were either nearly white or variegated with large liver-colored patches. We now see them either completely liver-colored, or of a flea-bitten blue or gray, or else black, with fine sterns showing much blood and extremely thin ears. There can be no doubt but that the crosses by which they have obtained the qualities and appearance I have mentioned render the task of breaking them in to point, back, and drop to charge one of no small difficulty. These habits, having been acquired in the original breed, had probably become hereditary, but the mixture with dogs which had not these inherent qualities has introduced volatility and impatience not easily to be overcome. It is also a fact that if a pointer, notwithstanding this disposition, should at last become perfectly well broke in, or, as it is called, highly broke, he loses much of his natural sagacity. His powers of endurance are, however, very great. A friend of mine, an ardent sportsman, had a pointer crossed with a foxhound, and it was the only one he had. Day after day he took this dog out with him, from daybreak till late in the evening, and he never flagged or showed fatigue. It was calculated that he could not traverse less than 120 miles each day. This dog showed extraordinary sagacity. While hunting in a large fallow field, he made a point, and then slowly and cautiously proceeded, closely followed by his master. In this way he led him over a good part of the field, till it was supposed the dog was drawing on the scent of a hare, which had stolen away. At last he set off running as hard as he could, made a large circuit to the left, and then came to a point immediately opposite to his master, who then advanced and put up a covey of birds between him and the dog. The following is a proof of the perfection to which pointers may be brought. The friend above referred to went out shooting with a gentleman celebrated for the goodness of his breed. They took the field with eight of these dogs. If one pointed, all the rest immediately backed steadily. If a partridge was shot, they all dropped to charge, and whichsoever dog was called to bring the bird, the rest never stirred till they were told to do so. Dogs thus broke in are of great value, and bring large prices, from fifty to a hundred guineas have been given for a good dog. Pointers frequently show extraordinary sense, especially in their own peculiar vocation. Thus a pointer has been known to refuse to hunt for a person who had previously missed every bird the dog had found. He left him with every mark of disgust, nor could any coaxing induce him to continue with his unsportsmanlike companion. 
three pointers were taken out grouse shooting in ireland they were all of the same breed or rather nearly related to each other one being the grandmother the other her daughter and the third her granddaughter the latter who could get over the ground quicker than the others put up first one pack of grouse and then another for which faults she was flogged again and again having done the same thing the third time the steady old grandmother was so provoked that she ran at the culprit knocked her over and over and did not cease to attack her till she had driven her home the authenticity of this anecdote need not be doubted it is a proof of the extraordinary sense of a dog and is corroborated by a fact already mentioned in the introductory remarks page thirty three of one dog attacking another for having misconducted himself some very bad shots went out partridge shooting attended by a very good old steady pointer after shooting for some hours with very little success they began to amuse themselves by firing at a piece of paper stuck on a post the disgust of the old dog at this proceeding may be imagined he ran home in further proof of the dislike a pointer will show to a bad shot, I will adduce the following anecdote mentioned by Captain Brown. A gentleman, on his requesting the loan of a pointer dog from a friend, was informed by him that the dog would behave very well so long as he could kill his birds, but if he frequently missed them it would run home and leave him. The dog was sent, and the following day was fixed for trial but unfortunately his new master was a remarkably bad shot. Bird after bird rose and was fired at, but still pursued its flight untouched, till at last the pointer became careless, and often missed his game. As if seemingly willing, however, to give one chance more, he made a dead stop at a fern-bush, with his nose pointed downward, the forefoot bent, and his tail straight and steady. In this position he remained firm till the sportsman was close to him, with both barrels cocked. Then, moving steadily forward for a few paces, he at last stood still near a bunch of heather, the tail expressing the anxiety of the mind by moving regularly backwards and forwards. At last outsprung a fine old black cock. Bang, bang, went both barrels, but the bird escaped unhurt. The patience of the dog was now quite exhausted, and instead of dropping to charge, he turned boldly round, placed his tail between his legs, gave one howl long and loud, and set off as fast as he could to his own home. I have seen a pointer leap on the top of a high gate in going from one field to another, and remain steadily there till I came up to him. He had suddenly come on the scent of birds, and made his point from his uncomfortable situation on the gate. Captain Brown also relates a nearly similar instance of the staunchness of a pointer, which he received from a friend of his. This gentleman was shooting in Scotland, when one of his dogs, in going over a stone wall, about four feet high, got the scent of some birds on the other side of the wall, just as she made the leap. She hung by her forelegs appearing at a distance as if they had got fastened among the stones, and that she could not extricate herself. In this position she remained until her master came up. It was then evident that it was her caution for fear of flushing some birds on the other side of the wall, which prevented her from taking the leap, or rather which was the cause of her making this extraordinary point. Mr. Daniel, in his Rural Sports, mentions the circumstance of two pointers having stood at one point an hour and a quarter, while an artist took a sketch of them. A dog of the pointer kind, brought from South Carolina in an English merchant vessel, was a remarkable prognosticator of bad weather. Whenever he was observed to prick up his ears, scratch the deck, and rear himself to look to the windward, whence he would eagerly snuff up the wind, if it was then the finest weather imaginable, the crew were sure of a tempest succeeding, and the dog became so useful that whenever they perceived the fit upon him, they immediately reefed the sails and took in their spare canvas to prepare for the worst. Other animals are prognosticators of weather also, and there is seldom a storm at sea, but it is foretold by some of the natural marine barometers on board, many hours before the gale. 
the following circumstance serves also to prove the extreme stanchness of a pointer it is related by captain brown a servant who used to shoot for mr clutterbuck of bradford had on one occasion a pointer of this gentleman's which afforded him an excellent day's sport on returning the night being dark he dropped by some chance two or three birds out of his bag and on coming home he missed them having informed a fellow-servant of his loss he requested him to get up early the next morning and seek for them near the turnpike being certain that he had brought them as far as that place the man accordingly went there and not a hundred yards from the spot mentioned by his companion he to his surprise found the pointer lying near the birds and where he probably had remained all night although the poor animal had been severely hunted the day before for the following instance of the sagacity of a pointer i am indebted to lord stowell mr edward cook after having lived some time with his brother at tuxton in northumberland went to america and took with him a pointer dog which he lost soon afterwards while shooting in the woods near baltimore some time after mr and mrs cook who continued to reside at tuxton were alarmed at hearing a dog in the night they admitted it into the house and found that it was the same their brother had taken with him to america the dog lived with them until his master returned home when they mutually recognized each other mr cook was never able to trace by what vessel the dog had left america or in what part of england it had been landed this anecdote confirms others which i have already mentioned relative to dogs finding their way back to this country from considerable distances Lieutenant Ship, in his memoirs, mentions the case of a soldier in India, who, having presented his dog to an acquaintance, by whom he was taken a distance of four hundred miles, was surprised to see him back in a few days afterwards. When the faithful animal returned, he searched through the whole barracks for his master, and at length, finding him asleep, he awoke him by licking his face. Pointers have been known to go out by themselves for the purpose of finding game, and when they have succeeded have returned to their master, and by significant signs and gestures have led them directly to the spot. The mental faculties of pointers are extremely acute. When once they become conscious of their own powers and of what is required of them, they seldom commit a fault and do their duty with alacrity and devotion old pointers are apt to hunt the hedgerows of a field before they begin to quarter the ground i have seen dogs severely rated and punished for doing this but the cause is obvious they are aware that game is more frequently to be found in hedgerows than in the open ground and therefore very naturally take the readiest way of finding it an interesting exhibition of clever dogs took place in london in the summer of eighteen forty three under the auspices of m lenard a french gentleman of scientific attainments and enlightened character who had for some years directed his attention to the reasoning powers of animals and their cultivation two pointers brock and phylax had been the especial objects of his instruction and their intellectual capacities had been excited in an extraordinary degree a writer in the atlas newspaper thus speaks of the exhibition of these animals m leonard's dogs are not merely clever well-taught animals which by dint of practice can pick up a particular letter or can by a sort of instinct indicate a number which may be asked for they call into action powers which if not strictly intellectual approximate very closely to reason for instance they exert memory four pieces of paper were placed upon the floor which the company numbered indiscriminately two four six eight the numbers were named but once and yet the dogs were able to pick up any one of them at command although they were not placed in regular order the numbers were then changed with a similar result again different objects were placed upon the floor and when a similar thing say a glove was exhibited one or other of the animals picked it up immediately. The dogs distinguish colors, and in short appear to understand everything that is said to them. The dog Brock 
plays a game of dominoes with any one who likes. We are aware that this has been done before, but when it is considered that it is necessary to distinguish the number of spots, it must be admitted that this requires the exercise of a power little inferior to reason. The dog sits on the chair with the dominoes before him, and when his adversary plays, he scans each of his dominoes with an air of attention and gravity, which is perfectly marvellous. When he could not match the domino played, he became restless and shook his head, and gave other indications of his inability to do so. No human being could have paid more attention. The dog seemed to watch the game with deep interest, and what is more, he won. Another point strongly indicative of the close approach to the reasoning powers was the exactness with which the dogs obeyed an understood signal. It was agreed that when three blows were struck upon a chair, Phylax should do what was requested, and when five were given, that the task should devolve on Brock. This arrangement was strictly adhered to. We do not intend to follow the various proofs which were afforded of the intelligence of the dogs, it is sufficient to say that a multiplicity of directions given to them were obeyed implicitly, and that they appeared to understand what their master said, as well as any individual in the room. M. Léonard entered into a highly interesting explanation of his theory regarding the intellectual powers of animals, and the mode he adopts to train and subdue horses, exhibiting the defects of the system generally pursued. His principle is that horses are not vicious by nature, but because they have been badly taught, and that, as with children, these defects may be corrected by proper teaching. M. Léonard does not enter into these inquiries for profit, but solely with a scientific and humane view, being desirous of investigating the extent of the reasoning powers of animals. It does not appear possible that dogs should be educated to the extent of those of M. Leonard, unless we can suppose that they acquire a tolerably exact knowledge of language, that they, in reality, learn to know the meaning of certain words, not merely when addressed to them, but when spoken in ordinary conversation, is beyond a doubt, although the accompanying looks and movements in all likelihood help them in their interpretation. We have known a small spaniel, for instance, which thoroughly understood the meaning of out, or going out, when spoken in the most casual way in conversation. A lady of our acquaintance has a dog which lives at enmity with another dog in the neighborhood called York, and angrily barks when the word York is pronounced in his hearing. A well-known angler was in the habit of being attended by a pointer dog, who saved him the trouble of a landing net in his trout-fishing excursions. When he had hooked a fish and brought it near the bank, the dog would be in readiness, and taking the fish behind the head would bring it out to his master. A writer who endeavors to prove the existence of souls analogous to the human in animals relates the following remarkable fact of which he was himself an eye-witness. He says, I was with a gentleman who resides in the country, in his study, when a pointer dog belonging to him came running to the door of the room, which was shut, scratching and barking till he was admitted. He then used supplicating gestures of every kind, running from his master to the stair behind which his gun stood, then again to his master and back to the gun. The gentleman now comprehended something of his dog's meaning, and took up his gun. The dog immediately gave a bark of joy, ran out at the door, returned, and then ran to the back door of the house, from whence he took the road to a neighboring hill. His master and I followed him. The dog ran, highly pleased, a little distance before us, showing us the way we should take. After we had proceeded about forty paces, he gave us to understand that we should turn to the left, by pressing repeatedly against his master, and pushing him towards the road that turned to the left. We followed his direction, and he accompanied us a few paces, but suddenly he turned to the right, running round the whole of the hill. We still proceeded to the left, slowly up the ascent, till we were nearly arrived at its summit, the dog in the meantime making the circuit of the hill to the right. 
he was now already higher than we were when he gave a sudden bark and that moment a hare ran before the muzzle of his master's gun and of course met her fate a gentleman had a pointer so fleet that he often backed him to find birds in a ten-acre field within two minutes if there were birds in it on entering the field he seemed to know by instinct where the birds would lie generally going up to them at once his nose was so good that with a brisk wind he would find his game a hundred and fifty yards off across the furrows he could tell whether a bird was hit and if so would retrieve it some fields off from where it was shot he would never follow a hare unless it was wounded he would point waterfowl as well as all birds of game and has been seen pointing a duck or a moor hen with the water running over his back at the time nothing seemed to spoil this dog not even rat and otter hunting in both of which he was an adept as he knew his business and although he would rattle through a wood he was perfectly steady the next minute out of cover he has been known to continue at a point two hours in high turnips he would contrive to show his master where he was standing sometimes on his hind legs only so that his head and forequarters might be seen on one occasion he came at full speed so suddenly on a hare that he slipped up and fell nearly on his back in this position he did not move and it was thought he was in a fit till the hare jumped up and was killed when the dog righted himself so steady was he in backing another dog when game was found that he once caught sight of a point at the moment of jumping a stile and balanced himself on it for several seconds till he fell once when hunting with a young pointer who had only been taken into the field two or three times in order to show him some birds before the shooting season the following occurrence took place the old dog found some birds in the middle of the field and pointed them steadily the puppy had been jumping and gambling about with no great hunt in him and upon seeing the old dog stand ran playfully up to him he was however seized by the neck and received a good shaking which sent him away howling and his companion then turned round and steadied himself on his point without moving scarcely a yard this anecdote is extracted from hone's yearbook and the writer of it goes on to say what dog is there possessing the singular self-denial of the pointer or setter the hound gives full play to his feelings chases and babbles and kicks up as much riot as he likes provided he is true to his game the spaniel has no restraint except being kept within gunshot the greyhound has it all his own way as soon as he is loosed and the terrier watches at a rat's hole because he cannot get into it but the pointer at the moment that other dogs satisfy themselves and rush upon their game suddenly stops and points with almost breathless anxiety to that which we might naturally suppose he would eagerly seize the birds seen the dog creeps after them cautiously stopping at intervals lest by a sudden movement he should spring them too soon and then let us observe and admire his delight when his anxiety for it is anxiety is crowned with success when the bird falls and he lays it joyfully at his master's feet a pointer should never be ill-used he is too much like one of us he has more headpiece than all the rest of the dogs put together narrowly watch a steady pointer on his game and see how he holds his breath it is evident he must stand in a certain degree of pain for we all know how quickly a dog respires and when he comes up to you in the field he puffs and blows and his tongue is invariably hanging out of his mouth we never see this on a point and to check it suddenly must give the dog pain and yet how silent he is how eager he looks and if a sudden hysteric gasp is heard it ceases in a moment Surely he is the most perfect artist of the canine race. Some of my readers may like to know that the best breaker of pointers I have yet met with is Mr. Lucas, one of the keepers of Richmond Park. He perfectly understands his business and turns out his pointers in a way which few can equal. 
In August 1857, a gentleman residing at Ludlow in Shropshire had a pointer bitch which produced seven puppies. Six of them were drowned, and one left. On the servant going the next morning to give her some milk, she found besides the puppy a hedgehog, which had been in the garden some years, most comfortably curled up with them. She took it away, but my informant being told that it had got back again, he went to see it. The pointer was licking it, and appeared quite as fond of it as her own puppy. He again had it removed, the bitch following, and whining with evident anxiety to have it restored to her. This was the more remarkable, as on previous occasions she had tried to kill the hedgehog. This strange affection can only be accounted for by an abundant flow of milk, which distended and hurt her, occasioned by her other puppies having been destroyed, and she therefore seized on the hedgehog to relieve her, however incongruous it might be to her former feelings towards it. End of chapter 23 Recording by M. J. Frank, Portland, Oregon